Cool. So I think we'll get started. That's about all I can listen to that song. Can you guys all hear me? Cool. It's weird talking to yourself. Um, as you guys might notice, Tobias isn't here. Um, and so instead you guys are stuck with me for tonight. It's actually his birthday. So he is out for dinner, which is fair enough. Um, so I'd like to start by um, doing an acknowledgement to country. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm streaming from today. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that I'm streaming from land that was never ceded. So, one sec, let me get my screen ready. Um, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, I'm super excited to be hosting it. Um, so, I'll just run through some quick housekeeping. Um, I'm sure you guys have all been here and before and it's also quite a nice small intimate group. So I think it'll be great if everyone puts their cameras on if you feel comfortable. Get the grid view on in the top right hand corner and um, please feel free to just ask questions. Um, yeah, take yourself off mute and go for it. Um, so the agenda for today I'll, I'll be touching on the wellbeing survey, which you guys would have received. Then do a quick check-in to see how everyone's going. Then we'll hear from Gert, who's gonna give us an update of where the program's at and what he's been doing in Sydney. And then yay, we'll be hearing from Cecile, um, which I'm so excited about. And then we'll move into a Q and A where you're able to ask Cecile questions about what she's spoken about but then also about the program in general. So, hmm. Yeah, that's annoying. Um, okay, so this wellbeing survey, you would have received it in an email um, on Tuesday. And this survey is super important for us to understand um, the relationship between urban farming and well-being, which will then also help us um, improve that element of this program in the future. And thank you to everyone who has done it so far. Um, there is also an amazing prize for submitting your answers to the survey, which according to SurveyMonkey on average is taking everyone four minutes. So that's all it's gonna take. Um, so this prize has been donated by Michelle Sutherland and um, the company she works for, Arbon, who you would have heard her speak um, in this week's tutorials. Um, so Arbon does natural makeup, skincare and health products. And this prize is worth $600 and has all these different health supplements and nutritional elements. Um, it's definitely worth entering for. Um, so yeah, do that before Sunday and you'll be in the running. Um, so also in the theme of well-being, um, we'll just move into a, a check-in, see how everyone's going. Does anyone have any well-being wins of the week? Maybe got your kids to eat more vegetables or you went for a run or just feel free to share please hello everyone i'm emily um some well-being wins i guess it's not specifically linked but um i've started i find i've i've finally caught up not caught up i've finally started the pump <laughs> I'm, a bit, I'm a bit behind i've just been running a festival um the zero waste festival so it's kind of been on hold it's been there sitting there waiting but um and that's made me feel really good to kind of kick start that next phase i know you guys are probably like way ahead but um just you know a little win like that um but also i guess the other thing is 
actually meditating. Um, and I know, I know some people have the fishies now, so I'm, I'm sure they're very meditative, like watching them swim around. So hopefully you guys are enjoying that too. But just having greenery is really lovely. So thank you, well-being things. Love that. Thank you for sharing. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Hey, guys. I'm happy to share. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yay. Um, so I um, actually had a great few days because G came to help me with my um, fish tank. And I'm so pleased to say my fishies arrived today and I got them in safely. I was like, ah! um, so that was um, super, super cool. And I've actually not been feeling well these last few days. And I love that I was talking about well-being on that um webinar just a few days ago but I think the most important lesson I've learned is listen to your body so I was like maybe pushing a bit too hard and I had to actually slow down so I've slowed down these last two days um but now that I've slowed down an absolute joy was receiving those fishies today and seeing them all happy in the tank so I can't stop watching them is anyone else obsessed I just keep looking at them. I'm like oh my god like I can't so weird but anyway I'm, I'm thinking there's some scientific link or evidence that says that it's much much it uh, makes you much happier because I just can't stop looking at them so there we go I'm happy yay that's so good that's so exciting getting the fish um does anyone else have anything to share Yeah, I'll, I'll say something. We got our fish today too. We actually went out this morning and came back and the box was at the front saying live fish. So that was pretty exciting and uh, managed to get them into the tank too. So like Michelle, just uh, seeing them swimming around and just the kind of, I, I think the little bit of uh, anxiety about hope, you know, that they're, they're feeling okay as you put them in, but they seem to be quite happy, which is great. And for us too, we were a little bit behind with just getting the microgreens and everything, but we're getting into a bit of a cycle. And so just adding them like the different colors and the different, I guess, slightly different, um, uh, uh, not text, uh, shapes and colors and things like that on different meals has been great too. The colors just, you know, the aesthetics of your meal, it just lifts it. Mm, it makes it fun. And I'm sure it's now super satisfying having you know, everything together and you can see the full system working, um, which is so cool. Um, so now we're, we're, I'm going to pass it over to Gert, who's going to um, orientate us where we are in the program and just give a bit of an update of um, his last week in Sydney. Hand it over. Just unmute yourself, Gert. Hello, everyone. How are you all going? <laughs> Put your hand up if, if you've received a fish today or yesterday. They're all happy, happy in the tank. That's great news. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been uh, it's been a great week for us. Um, I've been doing a few visits in Sydney last week. With uh, visited May and Michelle, um, and as Candy has requested as well on, on Facebook. Um, We'll be doing some um, visits in Melbourne next week as well. So um, I'll be posting on, on Facebook early next week. Uh, so feel free to, to reach out if you would like to receive a visit or need some help with, uh, with, with, with any of your setup. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all looking great. Um, we're still working on some logistical uh, issues with the lights. So and actually getting getting those back to to get them to cups to the right size so that so that it can actually fit your extension. Um, so we'll be working on that uh, over the next couple of weeks. So logistics has definitely been one of our major challenges in delivering this program, um, and we, we've learned uh, a lot of valuable lessons. But it's it's really great to see everybody's patience and everybody's excitement and all the beautiful recipes going through 
Um, we were also excited uh, about um, what's, what's happening on Facebook last week with everybody sharing their recipes. But, um, we're thinking of doing a cohort cookbook at the end of the, <laughs> at the, end of the cohorts where we kind of uh, combine everybody's recipes um, about how, they, how they're using their microgreens in, in, a, in a PDF which will be available for everyone to download. So stay, stay tuned for that later in the program. And yeah, I think um, if, if there's any questions regarding technical issues or issues or being wellness it's, a, it's been a big topic for us in the past um when we were working with large corporate organizations like mervec and and and, and uh, um but also like hsbc melbourne airport so what we've been looking at uh with farmall in the last couple of years is like how we can really improve people's well-being through the implementation the integration of uh the growing of food and in our in our day to day environments. So, if we can do this on a larger scale, what, what we're doing at, at home at the moment, improve. It could really improve our our, our feeling of purpose and sustainability uh, within the city. Um, so yeah, this is for us another another pilot, another exper another experiment on top of the ones we've already done to see if uh, growing food actually makes a huge difference in our in, in our lives. I'll pass it back to Abby and Cecile, and then uh, we'll come back to a Q and A later in the program. Okay, so thanks, Gert. Um, I've just moved rooms because. I was, I don't know if anyone else was getting like unstable Wi-Fi or if it was just me. Yeah, okay, so I'm in the room with the Wi-Fi box. So that should be better. Um, cool, so, so excited to hear from Cecile. Um, she's gonna be speaking about the link between food, the environment and our health. As you might know, she is a really important part of the Farm Wall team. But of course, before Farm Wall, she's been gathering a wealth of knowledge in sustainability and health, working across various um, roles in local government, in the country, in France, um, studied agronomy, which I thought was really cool and I didn't pick off the top of the bat. Um, and yeah, mostly I find it important that she actualizes her values in, um, she's always eating greens, She's always bringing her compost in to get uh, food scraps to get composted, and she makes serious use of the urban farm um, um, in Alfington. So I will hand it over to Cecile. Thanks, Abby. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, it's true. I I'm living in South Melbourne at the moment in an apartment, and I don't have a compost bin, and I cannot put my food waste in the bin right now. So every time I go to work, I go to farm wall. I've got like three or four like boxes, like pots of like um, compost, and then I bring back some like greens and microgreens, which is like perfect. Um, so I'm I'm gonna talk about different things about like I just wanted to expand the subject of like food and think about like well-being of humans and the planet but before i'm just going to tell you a little bit more about me and why we can passionate and about sustainability and food so as you might be able to recognize my accent i'm originally from france i actually have been in australia for more than 10 years but i managed to keep my french accent really strong um and um I was lucky to grow up like in a family with a really great food culture. We were always cooking and we had like a garden, like to produce like food in the garden. And, and so I was really surrounded by that. And um, I decided to study agronomy just because uh, in France, it's a bit more, it's a bit different than like in Australia, we have a school called like engineer in agronomy, which is a bit more, um, I guess it gives like it gives you some like really technical 
knowledge about agronomy, agronomy for a few years, but then you really explore the whole food system. So like food, different types of food production, food transformation. We study like uh, food trend, uh, consumers, Merism and things like that. So it was like a great opportunity to kind of look at all the different aspects of the food system. And then that's, that's when I think my sustainability journey started really because I had, I started learning about organic farming. I started learning about ecology and all those things. And I had some of my teacher that were quite activism and would tell me about, um, I guess, intensive farming and really opened my eyes on like the different way of production and you know opened my eyes on the fact that what we are eating every day has such a strong impact on the environment so i guess that's when i really started like wanting to learn more about it and then like share so i was kind of like every weekend going back home and like while we were eating like our pork chops i was telling my parents about like intensive pork farming farming so um you know the last few years i think my family and friends like hearing the same story they ch start changing behavior um so that's kind of like that's where i really started like caring about you know food production and the environment and i worked in sustainability and i moved to australia i worked for the city of melbourne in the urban uh, sustainability department and I also work in the health and well-being department working on the food policy at the city of Melbourne and then the last two years before joining Farm Wall, I was actually living in the northeast Victoria such a beautiful place um, and I was coordinating the local food uh, network up there so again to look at like f the food from the food production to the transformation consumption to food waste and trying to kind of like have a look at this system in a holistic way. So um, that's a little bit of my background. And what I'm interested about food, it's like, it's just so diverse and there's a bit of a complexity of, about it as well. Um, so what I'd like to ask you is like, when we say food, like what comes to your mind? Like for me, for example, if I have to answer this question, I will say, you know, eating delicious food with a big table of friends and family. But, you know, food can, can just resonate in very different way with other people. So I'll be keen to kind of like see some of your answer in the chat or if anyone wants to share with us, like what's their first thought about food, it would be great. Anyone wants to share? Otherwise I wait and see in the chat. So just that question was asked actually when the city of Melbourne started their first um, food policy in 2012. And it was really interesting. So a lot of like 23% of people um, said that food was about enjoyment and taste. 23% actually shared that food was about survival. So human basic needs. 21% um, shared that it was about health and nutrition. And 12% talk about that kind of really social aspect to it, um, which for me kind of like really shows that diversity of like, you know, what food represents for society and us as humans. Togetherness. Yeah, so a lot of like community nutrients. So all of that, like it's amazing. It actually reflects exactly exactly what we said deliciousness yes um so that's and and what i think is interesting as well is oh i had like some slides and uh i'm going to share that can i share that abby through my screen yeah give me one sec i just need to make you the host I mean, they're not the most amazing slides, but it's always nice to have a bit of visual, isn't it? Oh, I can, okay. So I do. Oh, I lost you guys. Go here, share screen. And then, Oh no. Okay, how do I change that? 
go um, present in the top right hand corner. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. So that was my slide for like the question I just asked you. Some strawberries. I know it's not the season, but it's just the end of the season in France. Um, so yeah, the complexity of food and the idea that like what we are actually putting in our plate right now is one of the most important um, action that we kind of make for own health and the health of the planet. So I think that's such a powerful message to kind of remember because you know sometimes we feel a little bit like um, that we don't have any power in what we're doing and I think food is just like such a strong power that we have and it's amazing that you guys joining like the resident food like program because it's all about local food and nutrition and well-being so that link between like the human health and the and the planet health as well um i went to a conference last year in new zealand which was about for like a health organization like and it was interesting because that was the first time i heard about the world planetary health which i was like i love this this is like it just makes so much sense to me because we cannot think about human health between without like blood and health and food just has one of the biggest impact on it but to kind of like have an impact on it we just need to look at our food through like the lens of the whole food system um, because as i said this is complex and often we have all those different elements of the food system that are kind of like uh, managed by different organization or different department so when i was working at city of melbourne it was really interesting um you know when you think about the food production it was more like growing food in the city um it was the health and well-being department um but when you were thinking about food waste it was like more the engineering department uh when you look at like climate change it was like the sustainability department and so everyone was kind of like trying to battle a little bit um about who was going to manage that project about food and i think if you look at so many different aspects that's always like the challenge so we actually need to be able to kind of work a lot more together in like a much more integrated way to be able to tackle tackle those kind of big challenges on our health system and um i i also wanted to kind of like think about um what we know about food and how it impacts like the human health so there's more and more study that show that um, that has a strong impact on mental health um what we eat obviously but also like the connection between nature that's something that i've been really interested in the last few years so how the connection to nature can actually improve and uh, our mental health and a lot of people think like oh connection to nature like yeah I need to go for a walk for like two hours this weekend and I'm going to feel good. But actually it's kind of like that connection to nature every day, whether you have plants in your office or in your environment or whether maybe you're connecting to earth or like growing your food every day, all of those actions, um, they're proven like more and more beneficial for like human health. Um, and I think that's just like really crucial that we are able to measure that more and more. Um, and I think throughout this kind of program, we might be able in the future to kind of have more information about potentially how a system that grows food in like a close environment all year round can impact, you know, the resilience of like human. Um, so I also wanted to reflect and potentially ask you the question because during this kind of like isolation and very bizarre time of like the coronavirus pandemic i guess this impact of food on the human body has been um and on like the global food system has been even more recognized um so what the the crisis showed us is like well food supply have been massively disrupted 
people have been scared about like missing on food, missing out on food. Uh, there's been an increase on like local food um, production and also people starting growing their own food at home. Um, and at the same time, if you think about other elements of like food, in terms of like food security, for example, like now we're just washing our hands 10 or 20 times a day. So, you know, in terms of like that health that can be linked to like cooking or preparing food, I think there's like a strong element to that as well. And finally, I think it's been really interesting to see how people have been able to continue connecting through food, even if people were unable to meet with each other. So I'm interested to hear what ways people I found to kind of connect with others and their family to kind of like um, share with food. Like I know that for my myself, like some of my friends, we organize like dinner over like um, Skype, just to kind of like keep having that connection. Um, even like with my family in France, who we are trying to kind of like connect through food, share recipes. And I think that's really, really important to kind of like keep, um, keep healthy in your mind and in your body as well. So does anyone have like any example of like, I guess, big changes that you have experienced with your family or by yourself? Um, related to food, especially in this time of um, isolation. I'm just going to stop my sharing. Anyone? Yeah, Caroline, go for it. Ooh. Wait, take yourself off mute first and then go for it. Okay. Um, I just wanted to share that, uh, you know, when, when the um, lockdown started, um, I, have a, I have a food photography studio and, you know, all of our work stopped immediately. And I had uh, two staff um, and it was before um, JobKeeper came about and I kept sort of thinking, oh, what, what are these two um, staff members going to do? Um, because we just have no income. And so we organized to get together uh, once a week and we cooked family meals. So um, I would cook two, everyone would cook two meals for, for everyone to share. So you went home at the end of the day with six meals to feed your family. And what came out of that was more than just the food. It was that feeling that somebody cared about you. Mm. Um, and, and also, I mean, yes, you, you're eating different food that you may not necessarily cook yourself. But I just think that that feeling of, you know, connecting with um, other people and uh, to, just showing your care in that way was something that was you know, larger than the, the act itself of, you know, buying, buying the produce and cooking the food. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, we all really enjoyed doing that. Yeah. There was like a lot more, I know that a friend of mine lived like not far away and she would be like, try to cook like anything and then she would make too much. So she would kind of like drop, you know, in front of, your house and then you'll be just sharing food with others. Like there's been so many amazing examples of like different way people have been like finding ways to connect, finding ways to kind of like share food, fi yeah, finding different ways. And often the food was at the center of it, um, which I, yes. I think was amazing. Yeah, Anna? It's more, um, or thanks, Cecile, for your presentation. It's been really great to think about the food um, connection with um, and how it all relates to our mindfulness. Um, I've had an interesting process of thought over the last couple of weeks as the um, 
the restrictions have started to lift and we've been allowed to have people over and thinking about the food when you're cooking and being so mindful, like you said, of washing hands so regularly, but also like food to put out, like things that are sharing food. So sometimes you put out like chips or um, guacamole or like where, you know, usually it would just be fine, but now it's this, this shared um, thing that you have to consider that when there's a lot of people or, you know, a few people all eating from it, that it's actually can become like a a contaminated sort of um, risk, which has been like kind of a downside for me um, in what I've been mm. putting out. I mean, most of the people that I'm catching up with are just friends, but it's always there in the back of my mind um, on just like, you know, how it's it's shaped what I can actually put out on out for dinner yeah mm. yeah i think it's gonna be really interesting to see i guess there's like the before there's the during and then the there's the after because i think one amazing like challenging but also amazing thing about this period is it's lasting more than a month it's lasting for weeks so what we're changing is actually we're creating habits. So even washing our hands 10 times a day, you know, do it for a week, but then you do it for two months and then it becomes an habit. Um, you know, maybe learning about cooking something new, like all those new habits that we've had to put in place, they're probably gonna impact um, our life like after that, um, especially now that we're still unsure, but, all this learning and all this kind of like change of behavior, I think they're really gonna last for a long time. And um, even if there are a lot of like challenging things, like we just have to completely change the way we're interacting with our guests and like thinking what food we're bringing to on the table. Um, there might also be some new behavior and new technology like farm more home, um and new ways of like looking at how we actually see this change as a way to kind of like embed some like sustainable um changes in our life like i don't know about you guys but sometimes i have like those two frame of mind like one is like I'm, i've i've got quite an optimist um view on things and i'm like yeah of course you know we, we're gonna change things like this is an opportunity for change this is an opportunity to put in place you know to change the world and and i still believe in that and i think we're seeing like changes and but there's also another side which is like it's never enough and we're going back to the old one but i think i think it's up to everyone and it's up to us to kind of like keep pushing for the change we want to see happening. And um, whether it's like in our personal life um, and like beyond, I guess. Yeah. So that's kind of like the end of my presentation. I'm pretty keen to kind of like continue the conversation through Q and A or like if you have any technical question about like the resident growing program we're here to kind of like answer your question julian raised his hand before oh sorry oh that's okay um so since quarantine started my girlfriend and i've been going on some nice walks and um we really like finding overhanging fruit and just picking it um and eating it washing it first of course um, and we recently found a fajoa tree that was fruiting and um, we picked it and made jam and then turned that into cookies and uh, delivered it to all of our friends. Um, and that was really cute little quarantine activity. Um, and a few of my other friends have been doing similar things. So we've just been dropping little care packages off at each other's houses. That's amazing. Fijoas, yum. I mean, how many kilos did you harvest to be able to make like... It was weird. I think it was an abandoned house because there was about 50 fijoas just lying um, 
like spilling over their property mm. and no one was uh, it's around the corner from where i live and i've never seen anyone go in or out so we yeah. just yeah there were heaps it was awesome yeah melbourne is amazing do you know like i don't know if the app is still uh, happening there's one um i think it was a website called ripe next to me near me ripe near me which which is a website when people kind of like log in when they've got like um a fruit tree that have just lots of fruits and you can come and have it for free which i think oh, is i haven't heard of it i'll look it up though yeah on that note actually i've just moved into a new house and my next door neighbor brought us um mandarins from her tree so i guess that's another form of using food to connect us and make us feel at home. Um, so yeah, me and my husband really appreciated that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I wanted to share as well. Thank you, Julian, because you've just reminded me of something and isolation. Um, I actually every week started making my grandmother's soup that she used to always make like years ago. Um, it's like this lentil soup recipe that she had and her grandmother had and her great grandmother. And um, I actually ended up taking it around to everyone in my building because <laughs> I had so much of it. And, um, and because everything was sort of shut apart from the markets here. So I ended up going to the markets like every Saturday, getting the ingredients and then making it that week. Um, and I've never really done that before. So it was, um, it was super cool. And um my neighbor was just like, that is the best soup I've ever had. Like your gran would be so proud. Like I was so emotional. Um, but yeah, it was nice to make, make soup for other people. Yeah. And kind of like exploring the family recipes as well. Like I feel like I've heard some few people around me that like started cooking, uh, well, really started getting into cooking for the first time. And uh, often it was like getting in touch with their family, asking for like their favorite recipe and starting with that, which I think is like really cool. Yeah. And the other thing I found like really amazing was like to see how the food businesses kind of like got really um, smart in terms of like um, adapting to kind of like, I mean, it wasn't easy for everyone, but, um, I think next to a friend in Thornbury, there was this small like kind of business that started like creating food for people, like collecting um, local food and kind of like selling it through their business. So again, like if we think about like food, food system and the whole chain of the food system, um, there's been changes in like every aspect of it and, um, and people adapting and like amazing stories like that happening um, everywhere. So, um, yeah, it's been amazing. I hope someone is going to create a book about all the amazing, like successful stories of change around food happening during the, the coronavirus for the next generation to remember. Okay. Anyone else wants to share something? I think when you were just saying what what we'll remember about the coronavirus, I'm going to remember that um, all the gin producers started making hand sanitizer, and I've been collecting, you know, from the different gin companies all the hand sanitizer. I'm not using it. Wow. I'm quite obsessed with uh, hand sanitizer from the gin distilling companies. Oh my god, I haven't heard about that. That's oh, amazing. No, they're amazing. <laughs> wow. There you go. Adapt to survive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. Does anyone else have any questions about the program more generally? Oh, and also thank you, Cecile, for that amazing that. discussion and yeah, making everyone feel comfortable to be able to share like that. It was really interesting as well what you were speaking about so thank you thanks thank you um yeah any any questions 
Yes, go Sharon. Uh, can I just ask a question about the water in the fish tank? Because when I put the fish in, or we put the fish in today, so the water levels dropped, what's the best way to bring it back up to where it should be? You, do you just put, yeah, I don't want to put the wrong temperature or whatever it is. Yeah, um, hey Sharon. Um, you can basically just top it up with tap water, but, um, okay. and yeah, you can add a little bit of boiled water to the tap water, so it's uh, so so it's so it's like lukewarm. So similar yeah. to the water, the water temperature of the tank, so 24, 25 degrees, and 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 then top it up. Like if you got rainwater around, it's always best to use rainwater. Um, but if it's tap water, yeah, that will that will do as well. Okay, thanks. Which fish did you get? But which fish? Yeah. <laughs> um, guppies. Oh yeah. Awesome. They're all happy. Yeah, they seem all really happy. Yeah, they well, from my perspective, they look happy. <laughs> yeah, for no one, they'll they'll start to associate you with foods. Then every time you walk into the room, you have a, a an exciting crowd uh, through the glass. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, should the um should the water been standing like somewhere for a few days to get rid of the chlorine? Yeah, ideally. So the, the chlorine basically kills the good bacteria that we, we're working so hard on to to grow in in your tank. Uh, so most tap water has chlorine in it to kill the bacteria, which is doing a great job for our health, uh, the health of our drink water, drinking water. However, for the system. Uh, the chlorine will also kill the good bacteria in our in our gravel. Um, it doesn't matter too much in small quantities, but when we do a water change, like 20-30%, we really want to set the water aside for a couple of days. Chlorine is a gas, so that means that um, if we let the water sit in a bucket for a couple of days, it, it evaporates uh, naturally. Also for our indoor plants, for example, uh, it's it's not a good idea to to water indoor indoor plants with water we take from the from the tap straight away, because every time we water our plants we kill the good bacteria in the soil uh, by watering it with tap water. So um, it's always good to have a few buckets or a little a small barrel uh, aside somewhere where, where we've got water just sitting in the barrel, which um, allows the chlorine to evaporate. So we keep the good bacteria in the soil and in our systems uh, alive uh, that actually are required to turn the, the nutrients uh, to make the nutrients available for the plants uh, so the, it's always there's always a bacteria involved to make sure that the plants uh, have access to to all the good stuff and by watering it with straight tap water we get yeah, it's basically designed to kill those good bacteria that we actually need for our plants and our ecosystems to thrive. So two to three days will do, and then most of the chlorine would have uh, evaporated. Yeah. And then also on that, correct me if I'm wrong, Gert, you can um, use rainwater. Rainwater, yeah, the best water for any plant uh, and for your system, yeah. Well, I think um, Anna Jane was first and then we'll go to Paul. Um, so when you're topping when you're doing like a water change and you top it up with water that's been sitting for two to three days, does it matter if the temperature of the water is quite low and you're adding it to the tank? Yeah, ideally it's best to, to warm it up a little bit by adding a little bit of boiling water from the kettle. Okay. Um, yeah, if it's a little bit colder, the fish sometimes, sometimes enjoy a little bit of colder water because you'll see them come to life a little bit bit more when, when the water is cold. Uh, but but for other fish, they, it actually stresses them out as well. So it's always best to, if you want to be, if you want to be play safe, then it's best to warm it up a little bit uh, before ending it to, to the tank. Yeah. Sorry, Paul, I just have one more question. Um, in terms of the hydroponic setup, what are the actual um, plants that we're putting into that? Like, the, I don't know if I missed one of the weeks or I thought I was up to date, but 
have we gone through that already? Uh, yeah, so there have been, we've, we've added seeds of um, parsley, coriander, um, chart, rainbow chart, and uh, lettuce to your kit. Yeah. So, and you can either germinate them in, in, in seed raising mix in one of the half trays, or you yeah. can raise them in, um, in, the, in the foam cubes uh, that we've been provided as well. They're a bit more challenging uh, and, and need a little bit more tender loving care and, and, uh, to, get, to get it right. Um, but if you, if you want to basically not go to the trouble of raising the seedling, you can buy seedlings, wash off the soil really well under the tap so you only have the root left and then pull the root through the, the net and actually top it up with, with a few of the clay balls and, and add them straight into your hydroponic system. So uh, the, the hard way is to, to grow the seedlings yourself and go through the whole process, which will add four weeks to, to the whole process at least. Um, the easy way is to get a grown seedling uh, and and transfer that into your hydroponic system. Yep. Okay, and is that four weeks to actually grow the seedling to a size that you can then put it into the? Um, yeah, 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 two okay. to four weeks. Yeah. Um, and do you do it over the aquaponics as well, or do you just do it in the soil? Um, you would do it in the soil and always keep the soil separate from your fish tank. So we, we don't want the soil to be near the fish tank or the hydroponics tank. Um, from, a, from a contamination perspective, like the soil can, can uh, change the pH in your water levels uh, quite drastically. So the, the, the soil will, will bring your pH level down to like five, six. Um, which is not ideal for, for our systems, like uh, both in the hydroponic and the aquaponic systems. We prefer a pH between six and a half and seven and a half, uh, which is where you get your plants to grow the fastest. If, if it goes any lower or any higher than that, then, then uh, it, will stop, it will stop the growth of your, of your plants. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No worries. But yeah, a couple of weeks ago we did um, seed some chard, which if you did do that, should be ready to put into your system. I tried to do it in the foam, but it died. <laughs> oh, sorry to hear that. Uh, <laughs> like, like you can do it in the foam, like directly into the hydroponic system. So if you put your foam block uh, in the net, would actually um, and cover it up with one of the the white uh, five centimeter circles, the the acrylic circles that we've provided in the kit. And it's actually in the dark, um, and just like have a look every day, spray it with water. It, it's aerated within it within that uh, environment as well, and keep an eye on it. And, and from the moment it's, it's germinated, expose it to light straight away, and the roots will go and will find their way into the water, into the nutrients um and and you can start from there so it's a, that's an easier way to, to germinate it um however three weeks ago we didn't have it all set up yet so um and it's a good way to to, to trial the soil versus foam uh germination so cool thanks the, the soil just has a dis disadvantage that we never know what's in the soil and from the moment we transfer the seedling into the hydroponics uh you've got a dirty seedling so it's like uh, you might be contaminating your hydroponic system with something that that you prefer not to have in there well if you do it from the foam blocks right away um it's it's a clean way to to start your hydroponics there's, there's no um, there's nothing in there that you weren't expecting yeah. and can the foam blocks only be used once Unfortunately, yes. So it's not the most sustainable way. So uh, when you raise them in soil, you can compost the soil and then um, the clay balls that, you, that you're putting your seedling in later on, they can be used all, all, over and over again. The great thing about those clay balls is they're the perfect environment for good bacteria. So if there's any good, good bacteria around, they're going to find a home in those uh, clay balls and they'll, they'll provide the perfect home for your plants to actually develop their roots and, and uh, find a stable environment for, for them to grow in. Okay. Sorry, one more question. With the, the cubes that you put in the, um, the tray, do you actually take this, does it grow through the seedling? Like, does it go through, do you keep the foam in there? In the, 
sorry, that wasn't clear. Um, like in the bulb that you put into the hydroponic setup, do you leave the foam in there and it grows through it um, once, once yep. it's germinated? Yeah, you would leave the foam, foam okay. uh, and top it up with clay balls. Um, it is possible to remove the foam from the roots. Then you have to do it um, like a surgeon, very carefully. Like the, <laughs> you, you want to keep as, as 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 much of the roots of the seedling intact uh, when adapting it to the to the hydroponic system. Okay, thank you. Any, cool. <laughs> any 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 damage to the root will slow down the growth. Um, and when you when you got different steps where where it slows down the growth, it will take much longer for your for your seedling to develop. Thank you. Thank you. Cool, Paul, did you still have a question? Yeah, I do, even after all of that information. Um, <laughs> the two questions. One was, where was that hydroponics? Um, was there a video or a checklist or when did we set that up? I missed that completely. Um, I will find it now. I don't remember exactly which week it was. But it, was different. it was the PDF uh, the week before last week, I think. Oh, okay. So, Thank so, you. So there was no actual video of it, but uh, we did send it in PDF format. Oh, okay. I might have missed that. Uh, the other thing is we're on rainwater. So um, we put an alkalizing filter on the water before it comes out of our tap. Now I've had fish tanks in the past and I've always killing the fish. So I'm wondering, is that alkaline water okay to use for top ups or water changes? Yeah, it's great for your body alkaline water. So drinking, drink, drinking water with a high pH is, is uh, a very important source of health and to, to, keep, us, to keep us in a, in a position where we, we're preventing disease. So, um, for us, the high alk alkalinity is, is extremely healthy. Uh, for for the fish, uh, it's not unfortunately. Um, when you when you change the pH drastically every time you add water to the tank, uh, the fish the fish don't mind the high pH or, or a lower pH. What they do mind is a quick change of pH. Uh, hmm. So if it goes from six and a half to like eight or nine very quickly by adding, by adding uh, water of a different, different pH range, you actually put the fish in a shock and, and it will get very stressed from it. And if the fish is already in a position where it's not really healthy, that additional stress can actually uh, cause it to, to pass away. Um, there are different types of fish, like the African cichlids, for example, that, that, that really enjoy high pH ranges. Uh, but even for your plants, they wouldn't grow a lot with, with the high alkalinity. Um, so yeah, there's different ways to, to lower the pH uh, of your water if, if, if that occurs. It's either to use a, a water source from that hasn't gone through that filter, uh, that would probably yep. be the best. Uh, okay. And otherwise there's, there's different uh, pH regulators you can, you can, you can buy off, off the market uh, to lower the pH. Okay. Uh, they're often acid-based or citric acid-based uh, to, to do it quickly. Um, your drift root in your tanks and, and the hemp that you're using to grow the microgreens in, they naturally lower the pH of your water a little bit. So even if you're adding a higher pH range water, uh, it will lo lower once it's in a tank, um, but it's not ideal for the health of your fish. Okay, okay, that's good to know. <laughs> Thanks. Cool, so um, we're approaching eight o'clock. We'll maybe have one last question if anyone has one, um, but otherwise we can wrap it up. Which microgreens are we growing this week? Has everybody uh, got some microgreens growing at the moment? Yes. 
every, every week we're showing a new one and, and it, it goes quite quickly. So at the moment, we don't really, really know who's where with, at, at which green and which, which one's the favorite one so far and which one's been the most successful so far. Couple in the comments, we've got peas, mustard. About to harvest my rocket, move the cabbage to the tank, rocket and red cabbage, flame tree mustard. Wow, like all different ones. Yeah, go for it, Andrea. Oh, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, I, um, I actually started back at week one or two, I've noticed some very funky growth in the roots coming down into the tank. Um, I've emailed um, Toby about it. it. It looked like sort of like a, a cloud in between the roots that were touching the water. And I have no idea what happened. I did have a gap between, like an air gap between the tray and the, um, the water surface. Um, I didn't take a picture because as soon as I saw it, I panicked and I ripped everything out because I didn't want the, the water to be contaminated for when um, I get the fishies. So I've started again. <laughs> um, I, I actually wonder whether someone else had those problems. But yeah, I'm just growing peas again. I love the peas and, and that, that zingy mustard um, that has to be one of my faves. So yeah, I'm just growing those four again from, from when we started. Yeah, great. So, what what were you seeing on the roots? It was, it was like um, there were like little clouds in between the roots, and they were, they had like they were like opaque, and it was a creamy, maybe slightly orangey color. Yeah, and 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 are you sure it wasn't the fish food that you've been putting in that was floating in between the roots since? I've never put in fish food because I don't have fishies no. yet. Okay. Was I supposed to? Um, a, a little bit would have helped to, to <laughs> add ammonia to the tank and the ammonia, if there's ammonia in the tank, it naturally attracts the good bacteria uh, to right. start transplanting. But, but the four weeks, four weeks would have been enough to, especially if you had some, some root rot, that would have been yeah. enough to, uh, to add ammonia to the tank. And, I am... And the, and the pump was working or the air pump or the water pump were attached to everything is working just beautifully um i i have um i have a, a stainless steel bowl where i put water in for top up so i put the water in leave it for a couple of days because um from about week two week three onwards when i turned on the water heat i've noticed that there's quite a lot of water evaporating and so i always like to have a bit of water um, on standby that I can put in that doesn't have chlorine in it. And I have that water on my kitchen bench. On that kitchen bench, I also have, I make my own sourdough bread. Uh -huh. So I have probably, possibly yeast contamination from that starter culture. I make my own water kefir and kombucha. Yep. So I'm wondering whether in the kitchen there's like, a high contamination area that may have gotten like some stuff may have gotten into the water and I then poured it into the tank. Um, yeah, because that that's probably the only contamination I can think of because I always clean my hands yeah. and I'm quite methodical when I do stuff. Yeah, potentially maybe send us, send us a picture. We can, we can have another look. Um, uh, Wilson's here tomorrow as well, so he's very well knowledgeable on, on, on anything that relates to the roots. But normally, yeah, always make sure there's a bit of air in between the water level and the tray so that it doesn't yeah. uh, suffocate the roots and that your, either your air pump or your water pump uh, are running. Um, and that, that the seeds, especially the peas, aren't seeded too densely, so not on top of each other. Um, yeah, and that's that's about the best the best things we can do and yeah it, there might have been a, a, another contamination from from your uh sourdough we haven't had that experience before where we've actually <laughs> uh, 
the power though <laughs> in the environment of of uh, of uh, one of our systems. So yeah, like if, if it did if it did happen, then I'm very curious to learn more about it. And, and I hope. I hope I'm not replicating, but if I am, I'll share with the group. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's yeah, and all the all the healthy things for our guts, there there's good bacteria involved. So it's uh, finding out which good bacteria can 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 actually uh, thrive in the same environment. Um, yeah, yeah, curious to learn more. Thank Thanks you. For being here. Alrighty. Any more uh, questions regarding the light or the, the light frames or the fish that have just arrived? Um, I go for it, May. Can I ask just really quickly, my chard, um, wherever I've planted it, some of like, the, I noticed the seed was kind of like, it had a few corners. Do they sort of grow in three or something? It's really cute. <laughs> I, the, 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 the form of the seeds? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, they're, they're, like, they're like a bit chunky. Uh, Did anyone else notice like a few would sprout from one seed? Or are mine just alien seeds? <laughs> 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 but well, anyway, only a third of them kind of survived. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was mine. Mostly we, we, we get one, so you, you must have gotten the lucky, the lucky bunch. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, if, if a few survived, that's great. And then now that's over the weekend, let's try adding them to the, to the hydroponic system. And see, and see how they go, and then um, make sure we add at least twelve to fourteen hours of of, uh, of light, mm. and they'll start they'll start growing. All right, thanks. Cool. So I think that just about does it. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to tonight. I think it's been a really um, nice and intimate session and thank you again Cecile for sharing your um, thoughts and knowledge on sustainability food and health cool so well that's it you guys can leave now bye <laughs> thank you